everyone. I'm going to talk to you tonight about being a female engineering geologist and also being an entrepreneur who runs, owns their own engineering consultancy. I've run my consultancy now for 10 years, but I only realised about six months ago that I'm actually an entrepreneur. So, <laughs> so who is an engineering geologist? What does an engineering geologist do? I'd like a show of hands in the room if you actually know what an engineering geologist does. Can you just put your hand up? Oh, one. Right, I think I'm just going to walk off stage now. <laughs> this is definitely, uh, right, OK, I'm going to start from scratch. I've only got one person in the room that knows what an engineering geologist does, so I've got to start from scratch. Right, going back to you, then, as you're the only person that knows what an engineering geologist does, when you can think about an engineering geologist, is that the picture that comes to your mind or otherwise? <laughs> so even she probably doesn't know what an engineering geologist does. <laughs> so I'm really, really starting from scratch here. So when, when you go into Google and you, go, and you Google an engineering geologist, that's one of the first images that pops up on the screen. And I had to do a lot of digging around to then find this image of a woman standing by the cliff face. But it's a very, very blurry image because there are not many pictures of women engineering geologists. What does an engineering geologist do? I'll start from scratch. That photo on your, on your left-hand side uh, has got two, two engineers who work for my company, uh, a female at the top and, and a man at the bottom. And what you can see them doing there is taking soil samples on a site. What do we do? A bit greedy. I'm an engineer, like Helen said, but also a geologist. A geologist assesses the ground conditions. So we're thinking about soils and rocks and understanding how the ground behaves. I'm going to try not to go into uh, too much of that, but, but essentially what I do as, as a company um, is we work for land developers in the construction industry, assessing what's in the ground before any development works can start. So we drill boreholes, we take samples, we assess how good the ground is to carry the load of a new building or a structure or a road so if you think about this building, this great big building that we're all sat in at the moment, the ground conditions would have been assessed by an engineering geologist before the building was built. So I like to think they were actually quite important in the grand scheme of things. So we would take samples and assess the strength of the ground and design the foundations that keep the building standing up. When you think about geology, we have the man-made ground, which has been disturbed by man, we also have the natural ground that's been sitting there for many, many, many centuries. In designing foundations and making sure that a building, once it's built on those foundations, can stand up for many, many years, what we do is assess where the good ground comes in. So, for instance, if we were drilling on this site or taking samples on this site, we'll assess the top, say, one or two metres in the first instance and assess whether that's good enough to withstand the load of the building. If we find that that's not suitable enough, then we go deeper. And we find that we're drilling boreholes on sites going down to 20, 30 metres to understand the ground conditions. If the shallow ground is good, you can get away with a traditional shallow foundation, which is essentially digging a hole, pouring some concrete in it, and then building on top of that. But you need to make sure that the ground that that concrete is poured on is, is competent enough to hold the building up. If the ground is poor, then we go a lot deeper, and we drill boreholes down to, say, 20, 30 metres, and then we design the foundations to go a lot deeper until you find that good ground that keeps that building standing up. On the other side, I also get involved on the environmental geoscience side. So many, many sites that we're working on, particularly in London and the southeast, have been previously developed. So when you think about, we, we call it brownfield sites, so basically sites that have been previously developed. Many of those sites are contaminated sites, so petrol stations, chemical work sites, industrial sites, where there have been tanks in the ground that have leaked over many, many years. So if you look at that photograph on the right-hand side, that's actually an old petrol station that we were working on. So we had to assess the ground conditions first, understand the contamination in the ground, and then deal with the contamination by taking the tanks out, cleaning the ground up, and then making it suitable and safe to have our houses on. 
to not only do we design the foundations that keep the building standing up, but we also make sure that the ground is good and clean and safe for children running around in gardens, for instance. So what you would see once our works are done would be a road looking nice and, uh, and well built. But before that road was built, an engineer and geologist would have been involved in the design below the ground surface. Houses, we work on residential houses as well. So again, on this sort of site, we would have designed the foundations and made sure that the green areas are clean. We worked on many hospitals. That particular hospital is built on very deep piled foundations because the shallow ground is poor. Schools and many others, every structure that you can think about would have had an engineering geologist involved. Right, so that, that's what I do. And I, I, I will tell you how I got into this. How did I start off as an engineering geologist? As a young girl, I had a love for numbers. Um, I love maths, I love calculations, but most importantly, because I don't want to put people off uh, a degree in engineering if you don't like maths, but I do. But also, more importantly, I enjoyed finding solutions to problems. So the more challenging the problem is, the better, the more interested I was in it. So I remember sitting with my mother and thinking, what, what am I going to do when I go off to university? What am I going to study? And we did a, 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 quite a bit of research. And I realized very quickly that I didn't want to be a doctor, uh, which is what my parents would have preferred at the time, and came up with engineering. But when, when I Googled engineering, a mechanic came up. <laughs> and I certainly didn't want to be fixing cars. I still can't change my tie even now. Um, so I didn't, I didn't want to be a mechanic, so I carried on my research and I came across this uh, program at the University of Portsmouth, the Engineering, Geology and Geotechnics, which just ticked all the boxes for me uh, in terms of finding solutions to problems, but also being in the outdoors. So I went off for three years, the best three years of my life, uh, studied a, that degree, and then I started off my first job as a graduate engineer, and I remember turning up uh, to my first job and being handed a white van, uh, a hard hat, high-vis jacket and steel toe boots. And I looked at it and thought, I'm sure that's not for me. But uh, yeah, I, I spent the first three years of my career driving a white van across construction sites around the UK. It was an interesting three years. <laughs> um, I was, as an engineer, even though I was a graduate engineer, you turn up on site and you're responsible for uh, the, the sort of the guys on site, so the you, drilling teams, digger operators, and I don't know if you've ever come across a digger operator, but when I started off my career, they were quite daunting when you turned up on site. And I was in charge of these, and I, I, these people, I was sort of instructing them in terms of what to do. I did that for a number of years, and I moved on. I spent a lot of time on site, and I moved on into working for a civil engineering company. Uh, working, doing a bit of consulting and some contracting. So I had an opportunity to do a bit of both, being out in the, on site when I, when I wanted to and being in the office uh, when I wasn't out on site. So I had a combination of both. Then I moved on and I worked within a sort of slightly larger company and then I was, a, I, I was a head on to into uh, one of the largest engineering companies as an associate director. So I progressed quite rapidly within my career as an engineering geologist. In 2009, as you do in the middle of a recession, <laughs> I decided that I wanted to take on the skills that I'd learned from working for small, medium and large sized companies and started off my own business. So 10 years ago, Jeremus was born. When I started off, I did think very small and I worked off my kitchen table. I, I wasn't thinking at the time of growing anything particularly big, but I focused very much on providing a unique se selling uh, points to my client base, and that enabled my business to grow. But I, I was working as a, as a geologist, I was a child's geologist at the time, and a silk. Now I'll tell you something very interesting. In the first seven years of working within my, as Jomas, I didn't have any photographs on LinkedIn, or on or social media, or on Twitter. I had no photographs anywhere, I just had Ronnie Savage. Ronnie Savage, ch chartered engineering geologist. And that was enough for me, because I struggled with that imposter syndrome that I feel that lots of, lots of people do, lots of women do. Um, so I, I, I ran my business from behind the computer and let my name and my work speak for me. 
Then in 2000, I'll go back a sec. In 2016, I decided I'd taken my business to a, a million turnover and I wanted to continue to grow the business. So I, I remember speaking to a, an associate of mine and they suggested I go for the Goldman Sachs uh, business program, which helps high growth businesses scale up. So at that point, I, I, I applied for the program and I, I went on the program. And I remember uh, they, after the program ended, uh, they said to me, Ronnie would like to do a, a little video of you just to tell your story. I was like, okay, let's, let's do this. What's the worst that will happen? Um, and so I let them do the video. And a few weeks after I got this email saying, do you mind if we tweet this video? And I thought, oh my goodness. I put the, shot the computer and pretended I hadn't seen the email. Because at that point, I didn't have photographs on social media. Like I said before, I hid behind the name Ronnie Savage, which I knew very much sounded like a man. So I was, I was happy to hide behind that name. But then they tweeted, I, I said yes, as I, I, as I tend to do, um, and I let them tweet the video. And they did, and I had to put photographs out there. I, I then got the courage to put my, my, a, a face to the name, because the video was out there anyway. And this happened. I was nominated for lots of different awards, um, named top 100 champions of women in business, ethnic minority leaders, being named uh, most inspirational businesswoman by Nat West, Black British Business Person of the Year. Uh, Jomas, a company that I started off on my kitchen table, was now a sort of multi-million pound turnover company, was named best business, uh, best consultant to work for. You know, I was interviewed by Forbes and Telegraph and LinkedIn, appearing on Sky News and, and, and BBC News and a raft of other things. And the reason I've put those out there is because I struggled with imposter syndrome before the Goldman Sachs program. I felt when I turned up in the room and there were all these men around the table, all a lot older than me, um, even though I've been told now I'm no longer a young entrepreneur, but <laughs> <laughs> I still feel very young in here. But, but I, 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 I struggled with that imposter syndrome, but the Goldman Sachs program and that video of them pushed me to come out and I call it my coming out of the closet moment because I, it, it forced me to, to put my face out there. And I've had, since then, the opportunities that I listed. And I, I think it's important that I flag this up tonight uh, because I now see myself as that role model for others in terms of what is achievable if you're just willing to, be, to work hard and be resilient and put yourself out there. So sometimes I'm in the office, in the, having meetings with, with the team, or I'm out doing, getting involved in design, getting in, uh, working on, on major schemes like the M25 and the A406, and other times I'm out on site doing what I love, getting involved, getting my hands dirty, putting my steel toe boots on and get, jumping down into trial pits. I've got the variety and diversity to do what I want, and that's what working in STEM has allowed me to do. So why do we still have so many, so few women working in STEM when there's so many great opportunities and prospects for, for us? Why do we have 25% of, of, of the workforce only being female? Why do I work in an industry where only 12% of the workforce is female, construction and engineering? Why is, that, why is that the case? There are a number of barriers which I've faced, but I've got past them. But I think fundamentally, I've learned that it's important to believe in myself in order to achieve the best that I can. So I've challenged the status quo. I want to be different. And that's what I'm doing. And I'll ask everybody in the room to either challenge the status quo or be a role model onto others. I'm going to finish on this slide because I can see my time is up. <laughs> the two Steves, when they started off Apple in 1976, they wanted to be different. They wanted to change the way that we used computers. And that's how Apple was born. I'm a Samsung person myself, <laughs> but, <laughs> but my entire family, uh, you know, they're queuing up when the new Apple phone's released. So, you know, I think it's so important that we think different, we challenge the status quo, and I encourage more people to come into the STEM arena with me. Thank you. Thank you.